Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Frank Barron's. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I know there are many times when you feel completely fed up with radio commercials, especially cigarette commercials that don't give you credit for having a mind of your own, that talk to you as if you were a 12-year-old. And I know you've often wished that someday a sponsor would come along and give you what you really want, not jingles or double talk or wild claims, but the simple facts and a fair opportunity to use your own intelligence, your own common sense, to make your own decision about the product. In a moment, I know you will hear a Philip Morris program. You will notice that at no time in that program will your intelligence be insulted by fictitious surveys or paid testimonials or song and dance sales talks. I'd like to make one thing clear. You hear all kinds of claims about honesty in advertising, all kinds of claims about the number of smokers who have switched to a particular cigarette. Now, the real fact, the true fact, is simply this. In the past three years, Philip Morris gained more smokers than all other leading brands combined. No other cigarette can make that statement. This outstanding record by Philip Morris is confirmed by the published estimates of Harry M. Wooten, consultant on the tobacco industry, and is based on the highest authority, official releases of the United States government. Thank you. And now, Philip Morris presents Francis Langford and Lou Parker, starring in Philip Rapp's humorous creation, The Bickersons, produced and broadcast, transcribed from Hollywood. Here is Lou Parker as Lou Parker. Thank you and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Frances Langford in her other role as the Purple Heart Girl, and much more like her real self, has volunteered to sing any song requested by the boys of our armed services. This week, we were really bombarded with mail for one of our outstanding fr- favorites. So, Frances? Yes, Lou? For about 65 G.I.s, would you sing exactly like you? I'd be glad to sing it for 65,000 of them, Lou. So, with the help of Tony Romano and his orchestra, this is for you, fellas. I know why I've waited Know why I've been blue Afraid it's not for someone Exactly like you Why should we spend money On a show or two No one does but loves you Exactly like you, you make me feel so grand. I wanna have the world to you. You seem to understand each foolish little dream I'm dreaming, scheme I'm scheming. I know why my mama taught me to be true. She led me for someone exactly like you. Ladies and gentlemen, here are Francis Langford and Lou Parker as John and Blanche Bickerson in The Honeymoon is Over. John? Wait a minute. 
minute. Come on out from under that car. I want to talk to you. John! What do you want, Blanche? Where's Nature Boy? Who? The cat. I haven't seen him all morning. I think he's lost. He's not lost. He's under the car with me. Where? That black alley cat isn't ours. Nature Boy has a golden coat. That's him. I've been petting him. <laughs> You've been wiping your hands on him. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, John Pickerson. Well, he had no business to come sniffing around while I was changing the brake fluid. Fine way you picked to spend your vacation under a car. I'm trying to fix it so we can go for a ride. I don't want to ride in this thing. You've got a whole week off from your job. Why don't you do something with it? What do you want me to do? Go down and collect your unemployment insurance. <laughs> I can't do that. You know I'm getting paid while I'm on my vacation. Well, you're not getting as much as you'd get from the Unemployment Bureau. I can't help it. Why can't you quit your job for a week and collect? If I quit for a minute, they'd never take me back. Vacuum cleaner salesman or a dime a dozen. Stop waving that oil can around. It's pouring all over the seat. Wipe it up, John. Okay, hand me that cat. You leave him alone. <laughs> How much long are you going to be? I'm almost finished. Grab hold of that wire, will you, Blanche? This one? Yeah. Feel anything? No, why? Nothing. I just wanted to see if it was connected to the battery. <laughs> oh, take it easy. The battery is dead anyhow. Now, you're not going to get a new one. You've squandered enough money on this car. What are you talking about? The only things I've bought in the last two years are a windshield wiper and a crank handle. If you didn't throw money away on all those fancy accessories, you could afford a decent car. Nothing wrong with this car. Anybody will tell you that 1932 was a great year for Essex. <laughs> Unless you want to get this paint over you Are you going to paint the tires? I have to, the tubes are showing through <laughs> John, if you take my advice, you'll trade this thing in I'm not making any trades unless I can get a good deal Well, how do you know you can't? Have you tried the smiling Irishman? I tried the smiling Irishman What did he say? He didn't say anything, he laughed out loud <laughs> Because you're not a good salesman I'll bet my brother-in-law, Barney, could make a good trade for you. Barney. Barney's a shrewd businessman. Yeah. He can get things from people. He got plenty from me, all right. <laughs> I wish you were more like him. Hmm. Barney makes good everywhere he goes. Even when he was in the Army, he worked himself up to a field marshal. He worked himself up to a buck private. <laughs> How can you say that? You know very well we got word that he was made a field marshal. He was a private and he was court marshal. <laughs> Not field marshal. Well, what's the difference? Court marshal, field marshal. Stop wasting your time with that pile of junk and come in and have your lunch. Later. But your creamed anchovies are getting cold. I don't want any creamed anchovies. Throw them away. I will not. I've got a good mind to eat them myself. Fine. If I get indigestion, it's your fault. Hi, Blanche. Barney, how did you get in here? The front door was locked. I had a key made. What'd you do that for? For your own protection, Blanche. I always check my friends' apartments for prowlers when they're not home. Prowlers? Yeah. And let me warn you, never hide money in the sugar bowl when you're not home, Blanche, because that's the first place a crook looks. How did you know I had money in the sugar bowl? I just guessed it. Well, it's only four dollars. Three sixty-five. <laughs> Listen, Blanche, have you decided yet where you're going to spend John's vacation? Not yet. Why? Well, I'm in the real estate business now, you know. No, I didn't know that. Oh, just a few exclusive summer rentals. I'm the sole agent for Leo Gooseby's Summer Cottage. Have you ever seen it? No. It would be perfect for you and John. Every modern convenience. Wood stove, oil lamp, and you don't have to go very far for water. It's right in the edge of a swamp. <laughs> I heard it was near a lake. It was, but it dried up. They've got the most beautiful cactus there now. Well, Barney, I don't You can think... have the dump for $25 and I'll waive my commission. Well, that is a bargain. But I don't know. John hates the country. He don't know what's good for him. The country's healthy, and the altitude might cure his snoring. You think so? Mm hmm I haven't slept a single night in four months. You sure look it. <laughs> Believe me, I'm thinking of your health, and I won't make a dime on the deal. Well, I know it would be good for John if he'd only try it, but how am I going to get him up there? Oh, that's easy. Get him to give you a driving lesson, and while you're driving, keep driving right up to the Goosebees. Barney, you've got the most wonderful, conniving brain. <laughs> oh, it's nothing. I'll notify Leo that you're going up there. So long, Blanche. Thanks, Barney. Oh, uh, by the way, Blanche, as long as you're going to be away for a week, do you mind if I use your apartment? What for? Well, you see, I'm throwing a big poker party tonight for the gang from the United Nations Pool Hall. Well, I don't think John would like it. Blanche, what he don't know won't hurt him. <laughs> 
Besides, I'll cut you in on my poker winning. Well, I could use the money. How do you know you're going to win? We're using my card. <laughs> John, put these in the back seat. Blanche, you're only going to drive around the block. What do you want with three suitcases? I'm taking them to the laundry. What for? They're not dirty. <laughs> the laundry's inside. Well, you're going to teach me to drive, or aren't you? Get in. All right. What do I do? Shift the first, let out the clutch, and feed the gas slowly. Have you got that? Yes. Start the car. Seat's too far back. It's not too far back. But I can't see the radiator cap. Why do you want to see the radiator cap? How else can I aim it? <laughs> you steer it. You don't aim it. It's not a weapon. Let's go. Don't rush me. Now, let's see. Put the clutch in. Shift to first. Let the clutch up. Easy. Feed gas. There. Well, why aren't we moving? You didn't start the motor. <laughs> what motor? The one that comes with the car. <laughs> What do you mean? What motor? Don't snap at me. I'm not snapping. Start the car. Oh, all right. Wait a minute. Stop. 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 What's wrong? Am I going too fast? You're not moving. Take your foot off. <laughs> the motor won't start unless you turn on the ignition. Where's the ignition? On the dashboard there. The key is in it. Why do you have to lock it? Nobody's going to steal your ignition. <laughs> How's that? Wonderful. Now put it in first. Let the clutch out easy and you'll roll slowly and smoothly. There. Now make a right turn. Well, John, I'm doing so well. Uh, why can't I keep driving straight? Because you'll be on the highway in two minutes. Well, that's all right. I know a good wide driveway I can turn around in. What driveway? At the Gooseby Summer Cottage. Are you out of your mind? They're 100 miles from here. 47. I looked it up on the map. I don't care if they're around the corner. I'm not ruining my vacation by visiting the Goosebys. Move over. I'll turn the car around. Now, wait a minute, John. I'm only doing this for you. What are you talking about? Well, it's business. The Goosebys need a vacuum cleaner. You know how I hate the... They need a vacuum cleaner, huh? Yes, and this is your chance to sell them one. Well, why didn't you tell me right away? Well, I didn't think of it till now. Aren't the Goosebys fortunate to have a summer cottage? It serves them right. I wish we had a place in the country. It's so nice and healthy. Not for me. The altitude is bad for my sinus. What do you mean? It makes me snore like the devil. <laughs> Leave the dishes on the sink, Blanche. You can wash them after you make the coffee. All right, Gloria. Well, how did John like the idea of renting our cottage? Haven't told him yet. Let's go tell him. John, take that vacuum cleaner off the table. You're sucking up the sauerkraut. <laughs> Just trying to show Leo how it picks up breadcrumbs. I'm convinced. Now, I suppose you folks are anxious to see the rest of the house. Not particularly. Now, this cleaner has a... No... I'll show you around. You'll love the bathroom. It's just a short way down the road. <laughs> Well, John, what do you think of my place? Lots of insects, huh? Oh, just mosquitoes. But when the rain stops, they go outside. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, John, they don't build places like this anymore. This interior is solid beaver board. Where's the wall plug? I'd like to show you how this oh, thing works. Oh, please, please, Bickerson, not again. You're acting like a man that's trying to sell me a vacuum cleaner. Huh? You're a little late, old man. Last Friday, your brother-in-law sold me one wholesale. He did? Wait here a minute, Leo. Blanche! Blanche! What's wrong, John? Where did Bonnie get a vacuum cleaner? He borrowed ours last Thursday. Why? He sold it to Leo on Friday. <laughs> Wonderful! Are you going to get him a commission? I'm going to fracture his skull. <laughs> Blanche, why did you tell me that Goosebys needed a vacuum cleaner? Well, it was the only way I could get you up here. What did I want to get up here for? John, I just wanted you to see the place. We're going to rent it for a week. Get in the car. Well, now, wait a minute, John. We can't leave now. Are you coming with me or not? John! Listen to me, John. You can't drive home now. I wouldn't stay here for a million dollars. You said yourself the tires were so thin you could see the tube. Who cares? I've got a spare in the trunk. No, you haven't. I took it out to make room for the vacuum cleaner. Blanche, you didn't. We're 50 miles from home. Do you realize what could happen without a spare tire? What was that? I don't know, but I hope I'm shot. 
In a moment, we'll rejoin the Bickersons. Right now, it's time to join our roving reporter, Bob Pfeiffer, for the story of his interview with an actual smoker in Alexandria, Virginia. Okay, Bob Pfeiffer. Hello there, this is Bob Pfeiffer. While we've been setting up our microphone here in Alexandria, Virginia, Frank Higgins, my assistant, has been locating a volunteer to try the Philip Morris nose test. Are we all set now, Frank? All set, Bob. Bob, I'd like you to meet Mr. H.M. Cornell from Alexandria, Virginia. Mr. Cornell is not a Philip Morris smoker. Thank you, Frank. How do you do, Mr. Cornell? How do you do, Bob? About the test now, sir, I'd like to ask you one favor. For obvious reasons, we don't want you to refer to your present cigarette by its brand name. Is that okay? That's perfectly all right, yes. Now, Mr. Cornell, let me offer you a Philip Morris cigarette. Do you have one of your own handy? I do, yes. All right, sir, then we're all set. Which one would you like to try first? I'll try the Philip Morris first. Philip Morris first? All right, I'll give you a light, then I want you to take a puff, do not inhale, and slowly let the smoke come through your nose. That's fine, Mr. Cornell. That was the Philip Morris first, right? That was right. Now let's try exactly the same test with your own cigarette, which I notice is also one of the leading brands. Here's a light, sir. Remember, take a puff, do not inhale, slowly let the smoke come through your nose. That's the way, sir. Now, by your own choice, you tried the Philip Morris first, then you tried your own cigarette, and you made exactly the same test both times. Did you notice any difference between the two? Yes, I did. The Philip Morris was much milder than my own brand. The Philip Morris was much milder than your own brand? Yes, it was. Well, Mr. Cornell, you've just confirmed the judgment of thousands of other smokers who've also found that Philip Morris is milder. Thank you so much, sir. Remember this. The test you just heard is entirely voluntary, and no payment whatsoever is made for any statement in the interview. Yes, try this test. Believe in yourself, and you too will believe in Philip Morris, America's finest cigarette. And now, the Bickersons. Well, Blanche Bickerson's well-meant plan to spend a week in the country has turned into a nightmare. After wasting three hours trying to fix a blowout on his car, poor husband John has graciously accepted the Gooseby's snarling invitation to spend the night. Unfortunately, the sadly unequipped cabin leaves much to be desired in the way of sleeping accommodations. So the Bickersons have retired. John is sleeping with Leo Gooseby on the porch, while Blanche doubles up with Gloria. Listen. Are you asleep, Gloria? No. Oh, I hate to impose on you this way. Are you sure you wouldn't rather double up with Leo? I'd sooner see Leo double up by himself. <laughs> oh, John's not sleeping anyway. He's got the most awful condition, Gloria. He's some rare kind of insomnia and keeps us both awake all night. I can just see him lying in that strange bed with Leo, tossing and struggling to get... Mm -hmm. Be kidding. <laughs> oh, brother. <laughs> That's enough for me. Hey, Bix. John! John! Hmm. Yes, dear. <laughs> Sit up. What's the matter with you, John? Matter? What's the matter? What's the matter with you, Blanche? You look horrible. <laughs> I'm not Blanche, I'm Leo. Oh, go to sleep, Leo. I can't sleep. The only reason I'm in here is because I had a beef with Gloria. But if I had known that you'd snore like this... Shh, not so loud, Leo. You'll wake up the dames. First thing you know, you'll have Blanche in here, and then nobody will sleep. What's the matter? Don't you two get along either? Get along fine. I don't know. My whole marriage is one big beef. John... Do you ever have words with your wife? Lots of them, but I never get a chance to use them. <laughs> Good night. Oh, nuts, I'm getting out of here. I'm going to sleep in my own room. Who is it? It's me, Leo. I want to sleep in there. 
Now, won't it be too crowded? <laughs> you better go in with your husband, Blanche. He's blasting my ears off. Well, turn around while I put my robe on. I knew this setup was no good. Good night. What the devil's the matter with you, Leo? You keep waking me up like that nagging wife of mine. You're even beginning to look like it. What are you wearing that pink nightgown with... Blanche! What happened? Where's Leo? You blasted him out of here. Put out the light. I will not. I haven't closed my eyes. Close them. Hey, I'm worried about the animals at home. Hope you locked the back door. Cat got out three times last week. Cat won't get out tonight. Where'd you put him? In the birdcage. <laughs> In the birdcage? Where's the canary? In the cat. John Dickinson! Stop knocking yourself out. Nothing happened to the canary and the cat's fast asleep in the oven. Don't scare me like that. Are you sure all the animals are taken care of? I'm sure. Well, how about the fish bowl? Did you heat up the water for the new baby goldfish? I heated his water, gave him his pablum, burped him twice, and changed his diaper. Now, will you please put out the lights and let me sleep? <laughs> You'd have been asleep a long time ago if it hadn't been for your snoring. Can I help it if I snore? Yes, you can. Dr. Hersey says you snore because you have a long uvula and it flutters against your palate. Put out the lights. <laughs> he says he can fix it with a very simple operation. Why don't you let him fix it, John? I'll go see him next week. You say it, but you won't do it. Do it now. What? Go on, get up and let Dr. Hersey pull out your uvula. Are you out of your mind, Blanche? It's three o'clock in the morning, and I'm not going to let that broken-down horse doctor hack off my uvula. He doesn't hack, he slips. I don't care if he knocks it off with a hockey stick. <laughs> Nobody's going to fool around with my uvula. Put out the lights. Try and come up here in your broken-down car. It's all your fault. My fault? You had some scheming pl plan to rent this place. I said I didn't want to come. I spent the most miserable three hours in that room with Gloria. She talked so much, I, I got hoarse listening. <laughs> she kept trying to pry into our private affairs, but I told her off in no uncertain terms. Believe me, I was outspoken. I don't believe it. What do you mean? Nobody can outspeak you. <laughs> well, I have to talk sometimes. You do plenty of talking. You sure jabbered away with Gloria. Give anything to know what you were talking about. Blanche, they can hear you in the other room. I don't care. I saw you two at the dinner table playing footsies. Footsies? Yes, footsies. <laughs> I wasn't playing footsies. I was reaching for my shoe under the table, and I accidentally brushed against Gloria's cap. What were you doing with your shoes off? I had a bottle of bourbon strapped to my leg, and I was trying to pull the cork out with my toes. Are you satisfied? <laughs> gown that woman wore tonight. She ought to be arrested. But you loved it, didn't you? Now, don't start that. Anybody could look pretty with the money she spends on clothes. Every time Leo wants a kiss, he has to buy our new dress. Mm. Believe me, you're fortunate you've got a cheap wife like me. Oh, dear, oh, dear. You were married to Gloria Gooseby. You have to pay for her kisses. I'm not married to her, and I get them for nothing. What? I mean, I hate Gloria Gooseby. <laughs> out of my way to make myself attractive for you, but it's just a waste of time. It's been years since you paid me a compliment. Blanche, you're the most charming, gifted, beautiful, and sensible wife in the whole world. But you don't love me. I must love you. Who else would put up with you? <laughs> the way you talk, you think you saved me from being an old maid. Mm. I had more boyfriends than any of the girls in our crowd. Mm. I could have married any six of them. Yep. I had my pick. And they had their shovels. <laughs> did not. They were the wealthiest, handsomest, most intelligent boys in town. Then why did you marry me? For spite. What'd you have to spite me for? It wasn't you. It was another man. Well, you killed two birds with one stone. All those promises you made. Before you married me, you told me you were well off. I was, but I didn't know it. <laughs> I knew it. You're sorry you married me. I can see it in every word you utter. You hate me. Oh, I don't hate you. Well, you don't love me. You know I do. Well, you never say it. I say it a million times a day. What do you want me to do? Carry a sign? Yes. Okay, I'll take my next week's salary and hire a skywriter to write the words in the sky. Honest, John? No, Madman Bickerson. <laughs> Alone and let me 
let me go to sleep. I can't sleep. Why not? I'm never able to sleep in a strange place. I'll be up all night. All right. John, what are you doing? I'm packing. Get dressed. We're going home. Home? We can't go home. Why can't we? We have a flat tire and there's no spare. What do I care? We ride home on the rims. Come on, Blanche. Now, wait a minute, John. You're so tired, you can't see straight. You might fall asleep at the wheel. Yeah. It's worth a try. <laughs> ah, we made it. Now we can get some sleep. Wait, John. Before you go in the house, just answer one question. Do you love me? Oh, Blanche. Please, I've got to know. Do you love me, John? Yes, I love you. Now get the bags and let's go in. <laughs> Wait a minute. Who left that light burning in the living room? I didn't. Must be prowlers. Prowlers? Yes. We better not go in there, John. Let's go to a hotel and sleep. They might be gone by the time we get back. If there's anyone in there, I'll take care of them. Give me that jack handle. No, wait, John. I might as well confess. I loaned the apartment to Barney for a poker game with a bunch of his pool room friends. What did you do that for? Well, don't scream at me. I didn't want to lend it to him. Barney talked me into it. He did, huh? Well, I'll take care of Barney and that bunch of bums. What are you going to do, John? I'm going to throw them out one by one. You stand here and start counting as they come flying out. Stop counting, Blanche. It's me. In a moment, Francis Langford and Lou Parker will return for a curtain call. But first, may I make a friendly suggestion? You've heard the Philip Morris nose test. You've heard that Philip Morris is less irritating. Why not try that test? we believe you will find that Philip Morris is not only less irritating, but also more enjoyable, smoother, better tasting than any other cigarette. And now, once again, here are John and Blanche Bickerson as Francis Langford and Lou Parker. Lou, before I forget, I've been meaning to invite you out to my house. Why don't you come over tomorrow and spend the day with us? Oh, thanks, Francis, but I can't make it tomorrow. You see, I've got a club meeting. Well, how about Thursday or Friday? Mm -mm, sorry, club meeting. Every day? Except Sunday and Monday. Well, what sort of a club is it, Lou? Well, just a bunch of fellas get together, and we pay our dues, and then go home. Sounds weird. If you pay dues every day, you must really have a beautiful clubhouse. You should see it. It's called Hollywood Park. <laughs> if you're ever in the neighborhood sometime, drop in and see it. <laughs> Good night, Lou. Good night, Francis. Good night, everyone. The Dickersons came to you transcribed from Hollywood, California. John Holbrook speaking. Thank you.